dry bones, hear the words of the Lord. And that was from Ezekiel 37 that he took out of the chapter. This first chapter, I found it kind of interesting. It meant a lot to me. It actually clicked pretty well for me right off the bat in how he brings out that the word must be central in everything about the Christian life and that there is power behind it. Even for me, if I might, just for a moment, in my own personal walk and personal salvation, you know, I grew up in a, Christ, in a very Christian, grounded home and church. I knew some of the Bible. And even as years went on, I rejected everything about God, even knowingly. I even said, well, maybe when I'm 50 or 60 years old and I'm done and I've lived my life, then I'll repent and I'll believe. I even had the audacity of saying that. And when God brought me to nothing, there was nothing left for me, I realized, I don't, do I have any hope of salvation? Because here I even rejected God knowingly. And even in um, 1 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly. And that verse really bothered me because like, I couldn't even say that. And yet, I realized he is worthy of all. And I was able to hold on to some verses. And because of that, that is where I found some power. And like in Romans 10.13, he said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it was really at that point, I was like, wait a minute, if God cannot lie, if his word is central, if he's said these things and he cannot lie, then I'm going to hold on to these no matter what. And I'm, God, you promised this, and I'm holding you to it. And that is really, as he goes on in the chapter, I really feel like he starts pulling that out, like the power of God in that. It also, the word, there's life in it. And he holds on to Ezekiel 37, and that's where I originally read. And if I might read part of that. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was a full of bones, and he led me all around them, and there were a great many of them in the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life then you will know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. While I was prophesying, there was a noise and a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And as I looked, tendons appeared on them, flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says, Breathe, come from the four winds, and breathe on these slain, so that they may live. So I prophesied as he had commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on a, their feet, a vast army. It's crazy to think, the power of God's word. Like, I don't know, would any of us, if we believe God told us to prophesy, and yet we know the devil believed that, and he told Jesus, you could command these stones to be turned into bread. Why? Because of his word, because of the power of his word. So on one hand, as a Christian, God's word is, could be a love letter to us, telling us of what he's created, telling us of the story of mankind, telling us of a redeemer, but there's actually more to it. And he makes three points that I want to bring out. What is the role of Scripture? When finished, 
will Adam still have a job? <laughs> and how do we personally measure? The chapter starts with, do we have comfortable chairs? He asks the question, how do our visitors feel when they are visiting? Do they feel welcomed? Do we have a program for them? How do we greet them? I mean, it's like, so he asks the question, do these things matter? Is that what makes a healthy church? And right off, even while we were talking last Sunday, I realized he wasn't saying what makes a perfect church, but what makes a healthy church. And I think there's a big distinction there. Because even in, we could say in our own marriage, in our own kids, would we say the kid is a perfect kid, or would we describe them as a healthy kid or a healthy marriage? And I think that's very critical key in this. I had to ask the question, how would I describe our church to a visitor or someone that was like asking the question, where do you meet? What are some uses that you've used before in describing grace? Any thoughts on that? We might come back to that. So he makes the point, the whole word must be key. It must be critical because if we get this right, then everything else after this what we have hope of getting it right. And there's power in the word. And he's, he even goes so as far as to say, we must demand these things. This chapter will help you understand what pastors are to give themselves to and the congregations are to demand of them. My main role and the main role of any pastor is expositional preaching. Now, I don't know, he doesn't go as far to say that any other like topical preaching is wrong but it must be center. What role does the word play in our decisions today? And I've wondered this even, like in parenting. How do we use the role in parenting in describing salvation? How do we use the, in how we behave at work? And I know that's not exactly as far as the church, but yet, is it just for the pastor? Or is it for us? Are we all supposed to be preaching in some form or another? Is every Christian sharing the word going out, or is it just the pastor? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. I've even wondered on Spain, Spanking, take it as an example, which maybe is a touchy subject sometimes. But I've heard some parents say, well, I have to spank you because God says. And I'm like, wait a minute, hang on. Is that, yes, there is an aspect of that, but we've been given authority. And we need to be careful that we don't pass that authority off. Like that, because we have been given that far from that angle. So we, yes, can we use the word rightly? But do we pull it out as a, something to rely on, or do we something that there is power in it, and I have authority from it? All right, so he goes on to say the whole scripture. When we study the whole scripture, God challenges us and convicts us. We should hear from God things that we didn't hear, intend to hear when we set out to study the passage. God surprises us sometimes. From your repentance and conversion to the latest thing the Holy Spirit has been teaching you. Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? Don't you again and again find God challenging you and convicting you of things you would never have thought about a year ago? And his point is, when we're reading the whole Bible, we're having to deal with each verse, each chapter, each book, and wrestling with it. When we go to a verse, we're looking for something in a non studying the whole scripture, we already have an actual intent for that verse. And we're looking to get something out of that verse already. But when we're going through it from beginning to end or going through a book, we're having to deal with every verse. And what does that mean? And how does it tie into the rest of the Bible? And this, sometimes my problem, even uh, I was thinking about, we, it's nice to put verses up from the Psalms around our house or on a plaque or something like that. But why just the Psalms? I mean, I don't think I've ever seen this verse from Proverbs. Proverbs 30. There is a kind of man who curses his father and does not bless his mother, 
There is a kind who is pure as his own eyes, yet not washed from his filthiness. There is a kind, oh, how lofty are his eyes, and his eyelids are raised in arrogance. I mean, so he does make the point, he tries to make the point very strongly, central role of the word of God. In fact, he says, churches should have the word central to everything that they're, that's directing them. God has chosen us to use his word to bring life. And that's the pattern that we see in scripture. Uh, even while we're going through these noun chapters, I realize as each one of us shares, for the rest of us, we need to be challenging. Does the Bible actually back that up? Even the notes, the, what I'm sharing today, or what Adam's sharing. How often do we come on Sunday, or any time we get together, and have not spent our own quiet time, our own time reading the scripture? Do we come empty, or do we come prepared and ready to challenge even those that are sharing, to even question what Adam is sharing or what any of us are sharing? Not that we have to be questioning everything, but are we pulling it out? Are we prepared or is our toolbox empty? And even our small group time, do we come together to encourage one another with the word? And yes, we can bring nice encouraging thoughts or nice encouraging pithy sayings, but what does God say? Because do we believe that there is power in the word of God? Do we believe that it actually brought dead bones up? And that's really what every Christian is, is someone that was dead, made alive. He asks four points on why. Why God's word must be central. We were created by the word. Mankind was created. The world was created into existence through his word. And we were called from the beginning. He brings out Genesis 12. Abraham was called out of Ur. God's people hear and respond. Another example. He gives the example of the burning bush. Yes, the burning bush is incredible in the first thing, but what's more incredible? God spoke out of the burning bush. For 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. I'm not for sure if I go to the Bible think, every day thinking like, ah, what am I going to pull out today that I might be properly furnished? He gives some examples. God's people are those that respond to the word of life. I think that's true. For each one of us. I know it was for me. Like those, the words like daily when I first like, okay, I'm going to start following God from here on out, no matter what. I started reading in 2 Samuel. And that, I just stuck there for weeks. Couldn't get past the story of David and Nathan. And finally, all of a sudden, I started loving the word of God. And I started running out of time. Why? Because I know his word woke me up. And I think each one of us can say that. And we see that in the Bible. And Christ even set an example. In Luke 24, in the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scripture and the things concerning himself. I think it's pretty powerful that we consider that Christ even used the scripture constantly. And then in John 8, they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? And I think that was a challenge for me. Like, how often do I hear the, read the scripture? And like, I've read the whole Bible. How many times? And then, wait a minute. What has he been saying from the, even the beginning? Do I really believe it? Do I really think it? Do I really hold it to be true in every part of it? And then he makes the point, why is expositional preaching so important? compared to maybe topical preaching. I don't, I've mostly been around probably expositional preaching except for maybe conferences, things like that, where there might be topics. 
But I think there are other churches, and probably some of you have more experience with this than I do, where there's just a lot of topics, and there's just kind of bouncing around the Bible. I don't know, have is there any experiences or something like the reverse side of this that you've seen? Dave's laughing over there. Uh-huh. So sometimes you're like, okay, this would be good to come back to that next week and continue, and then they'll on to something else. And it, it can be disruptive. Sometimes it, it seems like it can, uh, you know, on the plus side, sometimes some of the topics of the day are getting addressed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, too, even like, cause he's talking about preaching, a healthy church, and yet what about our home, even? Like, devotionals with the family. And that's something that, you know, my family's kind of mostly grown up. I would have done it differently if I would have been saved earlier. But would I have started from the beginning of the Bible with my kids and gone through? Or would I have picked, you know, a verse? And I, I don't remember my family... Um, I just don't remember how we did that. I don't know if, if you've thought about that with your family, any. Just starting from the beginning and going through. So God gives us a couple hopes. What does God say about his word? I'll be your guide and, I'll be your, and I will direct you. He makes these points here. The word of the Lord came. That statement occurs 3,800 times in the Old Testament. I know sometimes we think, well, Pentecost and Acts and the Spirit of God, that happened kind of in the New Testament and during that time. But this was 3,800 times in the Old Testament? And that was way before the Holy Spirit in that sense where Acts brings that out. Um, and then he, in Mark 1.38, he said to them, let us go into the towns that I might preach there also, for this is why I came out. And the church was founded by the word. He makes that point. The church was founded by the word. So are we living by the word? Are we, do we believe that this is how we are supposed to be today? Uh, Psalms 1-2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and his Law, he meditates on day and night. That is a challenge for me. Like, am I meditating on God day and night? Does that guide how I respond to my coworkers? Does that how I guide how I respond to my wife every day? As a letter, I, back again to conversion and as a letter, if we see the Bible as a letter that God has written to us as a guide and as a testimony. We can read through it. And what parts do we jump to? All the good parts, the parts that fe- make us feel good, do we don't, or do we jump to the whole thing? And there's the dry parts, too. There's the, the names, the genealogies that are written down. But what if my name is not in that list of genealogy? How important would that genealogy be to me? Yes, it's really dry, but I would want to know, is my name in that dry list? It would actually be very important. So I think we've got to be careful. Yes, there's power in God's word. We see that. But two, do we see it, the letter written to us? And if I were to write a letter to my wife and tell her about me, and this is, I'm coming for you, be prepared I have all this prepared for you and all that kind of stuff. And I got a letter back from her that said, well, pray for my job. Pray for that I can deal with the kids today. And there's all these lists of things that she has and nothing about her, nothing about me. Really, I would wonder, is she in love with me? Does she really care about me? Is she enamored and does she delight in me? Or is she always worried about herself? And I challenge that even when we're praying for my... How does our prayer look to God? If we wrote down our, after we prayed, 
we wrote that prayer down, what would it look like? Would we be ashamed of it, or would that be something, this is someone that delights in God? And it's a little off topic from the book, but I don't know, I was challenged by that. If I ever wrote my prayer down after I prayed it, what would it look like? What would it sound like? But it sounds like someone that's just in love with God and glorifying him and just excited to see him one day. Third, scripture is sanctifying. Jesus quoted scripture to Satan. We see that. And he brings out, we got, God used his word over and over in the New Testament to bring his people back with the Judah and Jerusalem. He challenges us, to make Scripture central. 2 Timothy 2, 4, 2, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching. And yes, even for Adam or for the preaching here, there's a challenge there. Are we rightly dividing the word? Are we rightly challenging it? But then, are we doing that ourselves daily? We can't just leave it to just the elders here, just the preaching here, but are we doing that at home? Are we doing that daily in our small group? Um, And he leaves us with, faith gives way to sight. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But we're not there yet. We are still laboring under the results of the sins of our first parents and our own sins. And on that day, faith will finally give way to sight. But for now, We are in a different time, but by God's grace, this is not the time of total despair. He gives us his word, and he gives us faith. So, is the word central for my life and for this church? And that is what he leaves us with. Let me build now on what we've heard, first by asking us to clarify here uh, what expositional preaching is and if we're right to contrast it to topical preaching. So let's work on some definitions here just so we can kind of know what we're talking about. Let's start with expositional preaching. What, what does that mean in your mind? Uh, let me start, Mr. Pritt. You're a visitor, so we limit your time, uh, and Daniel will drag you out if it starts getting troublesome. <laughs> Expositional preaching somewhat has changed in definition. They, they always talk about Spurgeon being an expositional <laughs> preacher, um, and he was in his day because that's how they defined it, and the word itself says that because it says expose the scripture. So you can expose a small portion of scripture, or you can go through and expose an entire book through a period of time. But the word itself just means to expose what's written in scripture. And Spurgeon was more, he took passage and exposed that passage, whatever it was. Uh, Today, we usually define expositional preaching as only going through an entire book verse by verse. And so that definition has changed a little bit. But then the other question is, what New Testament examples do we have of any kind of exposition of the Old Testament in our more modern definition of exposition? Because most of the time, they pick out a very small passage and and, in usually a topical way, use that passage from the Old Testament. How many of you have ever ever read Spurgeon's sermons? Anybody come through those? Um, You'd show up every week not having any clue as to where he might be preaching from. Uh, it, It was not typically working your way through a book, verse by verse, you'd be lucky if he preached a whole phrase of the Bible. Uh, He could preach uh, 
two words, he could take just the words dry bones and, and talk, uh, preach about it. And not that it was in error, not that he was wandering aimlessly. Um, some of that was, some of that, what we would think of as randomness was because he would do that kind of preaching up to 20 times a week. So uh, a schedule that is really unmatched by anybody that would preach today. But to the point, um, expositional preaching in your mind, shrink it down to the root word, expose. Expositional preaching is supposed to expose what God has said in the text. Uh, you, you violate the kind of boundaries of expositional preaching when you just kind of open your Bible and grab up a verse and kind of make your own application and your own point about it. Um, expositional preaching is, is, is digging into the text and trying to, as a preacher, say what that text meant when it was originally given. And that's why we'll hear language like expositional preaching should, you know, uh, be according to the grammar of the passage and according to the history of the passage, according to the context there, because it only means one thing. Uh, maybe we fall into the trap, you know, in a small group discussion or something. Well, you know, to me, this means, no, wrong. <laughs> it means one thing. You might have in your mind some idea as a result of that text, and it doesn't mean it's wrong, but it only has one meaning. It was given specifically by God in its context to a people, and it meant something. That's the hard work then of getting to what is the passage saying. So when you, you, know, you, you read something in the New Testament, you're trying to think, okay, how did Peter's listeners hear this text? We've got a really challenging text this morning, and, and the hard work is getting to through all the kind of mysterious kind of stuff that's there and getting to, okay, what was the point here? Uh, you're trying to expose what God was saying in that passage. So um, we hear a lot today about, you know, verse by verse. That really has become the definition of expositional preaching in our day. Um, I think it is a pretty good standard because if you're going to study First Peter, it sure helps to have the context of everything that's being said. We'll see that this morning. Without last week's paragraph, we have no hope of making sense of this week's paragraph. Um, so that would be a lot of extra work to try to preach today's passage just out of the blue without any context of what's going on. Um, so celebrate verse by verse preaching. Uh, that, that, that's good. But don't confuse that with expositional as if somebody preaches a topical message and, uh, yeah, they're not so great. No, they may have taken a topic and exposed what God says about it. And that, that's valid. Uh, that could be expositional, comma, and topical preaching. Um, generally, what we mean when we contrast the two is this one stuck to the scripture and the topical, he just kind of talked about whatever he wanted to talk about and started wandering into applications. And, you know, this means you shouldn't go to movies and you shouldn't do this or that. And it's like, well, okay, that's not exactly what this text was saying. So you, you might be making application, and that's generally where we start getting into the problematic topical definition. But if we're exposing what God has said in the Bible, we're, we're on the right track there of expositional preaching. Uh, what other thoughts? There are a few other hands maybe? or Yeah, Roy? It seems to me that all messages are topical because you go to a passage and you may approach it from the verses before or weeks before, but your job and your task is to come up with what is the topic of this passage that I'm coming to. Do. So I would say all study probably but preaching does not necessarily have to be verse by verse. In my past, the problem was topics unhindered by exposition <laughs> and ended up being hobby horses that are flogged unendingly. Whereas if you go verse to verse, you get the topics of the scripture in the relative strength and weakness of their, you don't end up preaching every, every message about witness 
you may end up talking about what happened to the dietary law of our specialties. You did them as God said them in the balanced way you said them. So to borrow some Latin, some of it you know, sola scriptura, scripture alone is the sole authority of the church and thus of our preaching. Uh, but they would also speak of tota scriptura, the total of scripture. One, in defining the canon, but also in making sure we preach the whole counsel of God. Taking this verse, whatever we think is so important, and making sure it fits into the whole context of scripture. Otherwise, today, if we took the first phrase of one of our verse, we would read, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Uh, and so baptismal regeneration leans hard on our text we're going to look at and says, see, you're not saved until you are baptized. Yes, you put faith in Christ and make that profession, but your salvation isn't complete and forgiveness of sins granted until you're baptized. Because it says right there, baptism now saves you. Okay, well, how do we put that in the whole context of Scripture? Uh, and when we start doing that, and then even look at our immediate context, we start seeing, wait a minute, he's using these words in a way that's uh, a bit provocative to us if we take them only as written and ignore the context, the tota scriptura. Um, and so expositional preaching exposes God's word, his message to us. Uh, I want you to see this in the language of the prophets, Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. And I need my glasses. I need my glasses or Jared's going to have to hold the Bible for me. <laughs> Jeremiah 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord. You're going to get a lot of those references that Jared mentioned over and over again. This is the Lord's word. Therefore, says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Uh, classic Old Testament play on words. You have not attended to the sheep, but make no mistake, I will attend to you. Uh, verse 4, I will set shepherds over them, or 3, sorry. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. There's the problem identified. These shepherds are not caring for the sheep. They're scattering them. They're not attending to them, they're ignoring them, they're not feeding them, leading them as the good shepherd does, as we read in Psalm 23. Look down at verse 16. Some of this scattering, destroying, ignoring starts getting more specific. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds not from the mouth of the Lord. So that expression there, though Old Testament language, false prophets, is really the essence of expositional preaching versus the alternative. Giving man's opinion or man's, as Roy said, hobby horse, and not emphasizing clearly what has God said. They speak visions, or we could just put sermons, uh, homilies, whatever they might be called in other denominations, they speak sermons of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. And ultimately, this doesn't mean just some liberal denomination that ignores the scripture. This could be any Bible-believing church on any given week where the preacher 
the teacher in a Sunday school class isn't careful to rightly divide the word and make sure this is what God is saying. And they, they wander a little bit into their own visions. Now, we would never say, I, I have this vision that I want to share this morning. Um, but, you know, at times, and, and here again, don't, don't fault the next preacher that says, you know, uh, I really have something from my heart that I want to share this morning. In a sense, you know, in my kind of arrogant way, I often think, I don't really care what's in your heart. Um, that's not why we've gathered, ultimately. So while we understand that sentiment, like this is, this is something that is maybe soaked into the heart, it's like we don't need to hear from anyone's heart except God's. Uh, and if that's what they mean, then great, then hear them out. But I would say even when somebody says that, that, that doesn't add any weight or anything. That might be a personal testimony, but don't think, oh, this is going to be really good. No, it's going to be really good if it's what the Lord says. He goes on, verse 18. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Uh, key questions that could be answered in a way that brings judgment or answered in a way that brings uh, great hope. Verse 21, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. So the challenge for an expositional preacher or teacher then is to, as the text says, stand in the counsel of the Lord. So that looks like this round table, so to speak, this council. Picture the boardroom in your corporate office and there are all the minds around the table. Well, except in this case, you come to just one mind. It's still a vast table, but it's not made up of all our ideas collectively. It's only God's counsel. And when we come and stand there and, and hear what God says, then, he says, we'll proclaim his words to his people, and it will be effective. They'll turn from their evil ways. Verse 25, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as the father, their fathers forgot my name for Baal? So now, now we get into some real danger because now it's not just, oh, the preacher kind of went off on a tangent. No, now he led them away from the strength of God's name and tried to sell something else. But anything else is Baal. It's an idol. Uh, even, even application that wanders unnecessarily and outside of biblical weight becomes Baal. It becomes something to worship. Oh, yeah, well, there's righteousness if I do that. And what we've done is distracted them from, no, if you want to be righteous, be overwhelmed by the name of the Lord. You don't need to, to come and bow to the altar of, well, the preacher said we shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that, and, and that's what a good Christian looks like. No, God says he, they turned my people with lies, with, with the wanderings, with something that wasn't the counsel of the Lord. And now those people felt comfortable worshiping something else because once the attention was off God and he's not the central focus, what has God said, then anything goes. Anything will fill the gap. Anything will rush into that void. The great danger of failing to expose what God has said uh, is you take God out and there's this enormous vacuum that self-righteousness man-made standards, anything can fill, and we become attentive to it. We hear it. We'll, we'll do it. Um, 
And God says, how long will they go after these lies? How long will they pursue Baal instead of me? And so let's be careful that when we do devotional readings, listen to the radio, come on Sunday and listen to the preaching, that we recognize together we are trying to look into this passage and expose what God is saying. We would say it would be in a biblical context, so we're going to look at surrounding verses, other paragraphs, maybe remind ourselves of the theme of this whole letter or book, and then ultimately, how does this fit into all of Scripture? How does this New Testament idea match what we're told in the Old Testament? Because in our minds, if we're thinking, I don't know how this goes with this, I don't know how this you know, idea of cheerful giving goes with this language of tithing in the Old Testament. Because haven't we generally heard even tithing preached as a New Testament mandate? Well, how does that go together? Well, see, that kind of biblical context is important. We, we need to figure those things out. If we don't know, then we say we need to expose the truth of Scripture. We need to dig into this. That's a biblical context, the historical context. Remembering, for example, the New Testament came to a first century world and the author or the authors feel no need to explain much of what they talk about. So in our day, now 2,000 years later, we're trying to study the significance of these people, these places, these customs, meat offered to idols. Just when we think we've got it figured out and what kind of liberty we have, we can kind of start wrestling with that again because we don't really understand the meat markets and meat offered to idols. Uh, we don't necessarily understand living in a day where you might drink wine of the wine of that day for your stomach's sake. Like that would actually be helpful. You might have a little bit of medicinal insight there, but it, it kind of strikes us as odd. We need to study that out a little bit. The conflict of Jew versus Gentile. We might have a pretty good idea of it if you've lived anywhere, even in our nation, where you sense the real racial conflict of black and white. But even that might pale in comparison to the Jew-Gentile uh, conflict in the first century church. So a historical context is important. There's biblical context, there's historical context, and then there's even that grammatical context. And we'll look at some grammar today on that word saved or the word baptism uh, or the old adage, you know, all means all, and that's all, all means. Well, except when it doesn't mean all, <laughs> just means a lot. Um, and that's not undermining, oh, word for word, you know, biblical inerrancy. It just say, no, I'm, I'm going to be faithful to how the author used this word. Uh, at times, I might generalize and say, all of us understand when, and there's probably somebody who doesn't. Uh, all didn't mean all. It meant most. Uh, but we understand those meanings, and we put them in their context, and we make it work. But this is the hard work of Scripture. Uh, and, and most of the debates uh, that go on in the church uh, with theological nuance are the result of not fully exposing what's there or rightly dividing what's there so that we can see it. So we strive for the biblical, historical, grammatical context. Psalm 119 tells us that we can cleanse our way by taking heed according to your word. It goes on to say, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Peter would echo that in 2 Peter, saying that the knowledge of God and of Jesus, and he equates that with the great and precious promises, are all that pertains to life and godliness. So whatever makes up your life, and your effort at being godly is going to be guided by, rooted in Scripture, uh, what God has said. Paul, writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And we could say there that sound doctrine, straight doctrine, would also be the teaching, or the word doctrine is teaching, so the teaching that exposes exactly what God has said. That would be as straight as it could get, as righteous as it could get. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But the contrast is according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, that's an intermediate step that Jeremiah didn't tell us about. Uh, He warned us that it would become the worship of Baal. Well, I would say Paul's pointing in the same direction. Once you abandon sound doctrine because you think you know better, or that's not what I grew up hearing in my church, or, well, I've studied this and I think I understand it. Whatever is our own desires there with itching ears, longing for teachers that tell us what we want to hear, you turn away from the truth. Truth contrasted with own ideas and desires. You turn from the truth to fables, and eventually that fable... Here's the ironic twist. That fable, it's called, becomes to you the ever true authoritative Baal. It is now God that dictates to you how you will live. Uh, The fable becomes the deity to you, which is the folly and the blindness of sin. We turn away from the truth and you just have no anchor. You have no guarantee that you won't worship absolute nonsense. And so think about our world today. And the stuff that we think of is in that political realm or worldview and really so much of morality in our minds because it comes to us from the news. We think of it as politics and something out there. But the reality is people are worshiping ideas and fables uh, and It's because they've ignored the truth. Romans 1 tells us that. When you refuse to hear what is true about the Creator and what He has done, there is just no end to the nonsense, logically, but even morally. There's just no end to it. And so the the debased way of living that unfolds in Romans chapter 1 is one example. But here it seems like Paul is telling Timothy with, in, in a different realm, more of focusing in on the actual thoughts of the mind uh, that we would turn away from truth, hear what we want to hear, even if it's fable, things like, well, you can't really know if you're male or female. Well, that, that wasn't only Christians arguing for something like that for most of humanity's existence, but now... Even what seems to be absolute and defined by the, the ever mysterious DNA um, is now being rejected and a fable is being held up as something that we should all start considering a little bit. Let's ignore the truth and accept the fable, but that fable is, that has something behind it. That fable is being handed to us by what will be our God instead of the God of truth. So expositional preaching is crucial. Uh, You can put up with almost anything else in a church, but you cannot, you cannot put up with hearing only man's ideas. You must have God's truth. Now that's not an excuse for everything else to slip, but the reality is there are a lot of people around the country and around the world that probably attend churches that they wish the music was different or you know, they wish people would be a little more committed or they wish they wouldn't show up in, you know, halter tops and shorts and flip-flops. And they, they probably have a long list of things they'd love for this church to do, but they realize we're here because it seems like they're committed to preaching the word. And I would say, that's what you do. And that's where you go. 
Um, because the only hope of changing all those things that you think they might need to change is a mindset that says, we're going to come to the Bible and find God speaking there. And your great hope is that they will hear God speak about some of those things you think they need to change. And you might realize that by you committing to a church that preaches the word, you might change a little bit on some things. And I think most of us, over our years of church life, and some of you from you know, nursery on, uh, have done some changing. Um, you've thought through things. You, you realized maybe some family conviction or maybe some theological stance uh, wasn't quite right when, when it was exposed by God's revelation. Oh, you learned it one way, but ultimately that learning came through someone, and, and what it really was was thus said Dr. Richard A. Harris in the church I grew up in. Well, I think he was good with the word from what I remember, but he's not the authority. Uh, he was saying, as the prophets did, this is what God says. And so even from time to time, I try to say when we read scripture or preach or hear, open the word to preach, okay, this is the word of the Lord. That's not a liturgical kind of just say this before you do this. No, it's that reminder, okay, if we're going to open the word and hear this, we, we should be remembering God spoke this, and apparently in his providence on this day, he wanted us to hear this. So we'd better listen. Uh, so expository preaching is the standard for the pulpit ministry uh, of a healthy church. You need to hear expositional preaching. You need to obey expositional preaching as a congregation, you need to demand expositional preaching. Uh, and if we do that, uh, then we'll be on track. So this topic kind of lays the foundation for the other eight marks, uh, because whatever we know of these other eight marks comes out of simply exposing what God has said about them. Uh, as you open your word in the hour to come, uh, God's word in your hands, uh, and this week, uh, remember, the, the great goal is expose what God has said. Um, that's our great hope for living as we should. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the thousands of times, apparently, that you reminded us that you chose to reveal yourself to us. Ultimately, this is the wonder of Jesus coming as our Savior, God becoming man to reveal to us this plan of salvation. And so we rejoice in your revelation. And having put our faith in Christ, help us to embrace every command and every boundary, knowing uh, that your word is a light for us. It, it guides us. It keeps us from stumbling. Uh, may we feel that kind of need for it in our lives this week. And at that first hint or that first thought of uncertainty, uh, our first inkling of feeling like we don't have the wisdom that we need in this moment, may we remember that we do have your word to us. Uh, make us people of your word, Lord. Uh, keep our pulpit uh, engaged and, and pursuing uh, the exposition of your word to us, that we might be healthy, that we might know you, uh, that we might please you, uh, and that the world might see that it is not burdensome to live our lives for the kingdom of our God. Thank you again for your word. Bless us by it today as we give our attention to it. In Jesus' name, amen.